Kiara Kota, Kofruška Gora Temanga, Kodenju Teava, No Croatia Ho, Komandic Toko Fano, Kosendi Toko Ingoa. Uh, thank you all very much for coming today. My name is Sandy Mandic, and this is a lovely um, group of uh, team members from the BITS research team, and we will share with you some of the latest findings from our research. Um, so I will introduce here the team members, but they will all have the opportunity to present during the talk. So we have here Kim King, the BITS2 project manager, Lutfur Rahman, PhD student, Margareta Sitomoran, PhD student, and Kaisa Kentala, research assistant. Thank you all. You can have a seat and we'll get started. So it's my pleasure to share with you the latest findings about built environment and active transport to school research. Uh, and we're going to be talking about transport to school uh, across Otago. This has been a journey of eight years, and a number of people have contributed to this research. And here we have just a few team members that are presenting, but our team members span several universities and organizations in New Zealand, as well as internationally. Um, this is just the basic structure of our team. We got key investigators, we got a number of collaborators, and we also got advisory board members from the Dunedin community representing schools, uh, city council, as well as uh, representing Pacific community. And Janet Stevenson is our advisory board academic from the Center of Sustainability. So BEATS is an interdisciplinary multi-sector research program that looks at individual, social, environmental, and policy factors that influence how young people travel to school. And this is a collaboration between the University of Otago, Auckland University of Technology, the Dunedin City Council, and the Dunedin Secondary Schools Partnership. We also worked with Otago uh, School Principals Association as a part of a BITS rural study. So the whole program is set up to look at the transport to school, uh, taking into account individual factors, uh, socio, uh, socio cultural environment, so basically what peers think, what uh, parents think, or what the influences of the school, looking into built environment, uh, as well as policy environment. And when we put all these things together, this research program is actually spanning the fields of exercise sciences, health, environment, transport, and education. We do a lot of different assessments throughout, the, throughout our study. So for example, we have a surveys of adolescents and parents. We also did mapping of how adolescents travel to school as well as areas that are safe or unsafe on the way to and from school. We did a mapping with parents as well. We measured adolescents' height and weight, as well as we use the activity meters to objectively measure the amount of physical activity. And Kaisa Kintala will share with you some of that a little bit later today. We measure adolescent school bags, how heavy they are. It's really fascinating to see how much they actually carry into school. We can share some of those data as well. And in addition to that, we did a focus group with parents, uh, adolescents, teachers, and interviewed school principals to get a little bit more of an idea from different uh, angles, what do people think about transport to school. So the research, BITS research program, as I said, already spans several disciplines. It includes cross-sectoral collaborations. Uh, we originally started the study in Dunedin in 2014. The main study was around 2014 and 15. We got all 12 Dunedin secondary schools participating. We collected data in uh, nearly 1,800 adolescents. We also surveyed parents in the in, uh, data focus groups with teachers and school principals. So after that, we, in 2018, we went to rural Otago. So we actually went outside of the Dunedin and surveyed nearly 1,000 adolescents from, out, from 11 schools in the wider Otago region, in, uh, uh, surveyed a couple of 78 parents, as well as interviewed several principals. So what's happened now in our research data, we actually have a spectrum of settlement types that we have data for, and we can look at these different comparisons, including urban-rural comparisons. In 2018, we also initiated a smaller study to look into Maori and Pacific adolescents' perspectives on transport to school, and we conducted that study in the Dunedin as well as in the, um, the Bay of Plenty. So we are continuing that work as a part of the work that we're doing nowadays, and that's a big natural experiment, which is um, 
following the baseline data that we collected in the Dunedin, there has been some infrastructure changes, cycling and pedestrian infrastructure around some schools in the Dunedin. So we're actually collecting follow-up information and looking whether adolescents that are going to the schools that had infrastructure changes had a change in the behavior, how they travel to school, and change in the perceptions of that school environment for walking and cycling. And you're going to hear a little bit more about that towards the end of the presentation. So when we put together the original BEAT study that we completed, as well as the rural study, we actually surveyed adolescents from 23 schools in the Otago region, and our total sample size that we have in our study is over 2,600. So we have really comprehensive data on a number of adolescents across the entire Otago. We have disseminated these findings widely, not only in the Dunedin, not only through academic circles, but we also went beyond academia and disseminated these findings to local city council, to the schools, uh, to the ministries. We've initiated some cross-sectoral work and we, share, we organized quite a few symposia to share the findings with the public as well. In 2019, we won the award for the best research team at the University of Otago, and we're continuing with this work. So this is the BEATS natural experiment, or BEATS 2 study, as we call. Um, so basically, since we collected data in the Dunedin, 12 Dunedin schools, which are indicated here, uh, uh, several schools, six schools, had a cycling infrastructure, which is indicated in the red lines on this slide, uh, cycling infrastructure done in their areas. Uh, other schools were near the cycling infrastructure, but these are city center cluster schools. They were on the hills. They had some pedestrian infrastructure changes done in their school neighborhoods. And the remaining six schools didn't have any infrastructure changes around them. So we originally collected data from all 12 schools in the meeting, 2014, 2015. Some schools were exposure schools or exposure area to the infrastructure changes. Others did not have any infrastructure changes and we're now collecting follow-up data. So we started last year and we'll be finishing next year. So this is just a brief summary of what I've just shared with you of basically the disciplines and partnerships that are involved in this team. We have a research team with a really wide range of uh, research expertise ranging from exercise sciences, public health, physical activity promotion, all the way to, um, to education. And these are different projects that we've run so far and we're currently doing this natural experiment. So um, different types of data collection in adolescents, parents and teachers and principals. We had a couple of spin-off projects. I will not be talking about that today, but we also did really pay a lot of attention to disseminate these findings widely, including publishing 27 journal articles to date. So what I'm gonna do now is a little journey. I'm gonna take you through some of these areas in some of our findings, and then I'm gonna pass over to our PhD students to share the research they're currently doing. So we published a few research methodology articles describing the details, how did we actually initiate the BEAT study, how did we implement it, and the study protocols. We then published a couple of findings in the area of adolescents' health and physical activity. And I'm just gonna share one of the recent findings here with you. So we gave adolescents these activity meters to wear and uh, we surveyed, we, we had about over 400 adolescents in both rural study and the Nathan study wearing those. So we found that uh, actually there is really low level of physical activity or number of adolescents that meet physical activity guidelines across all different settlement types. But we obviously we observed a higher level of physical activity among those that use active transport to school. And there were also some differences that adolescents living in rural areas tend to be uh, more sedentary um, after school. But uh, those ones that lived in urban areas tended to do uh, the large urban area tended to do accumulate more physical activity during the school commute time. So again, that contributed to the higher levels of physical activity. Our previous research in Dunedin only showed that if we look at those who use different modes of transport to school, adolescents using active transport and those ones that are combining active and motorized transport, actually about almost 50% of them uh, met minimum physical activity guidelines compared to only one third of those that use motorized transport. 
So this is very interesting implication saying that even those adolescents live too far away from school to be able to walk or cycle to school, they can actually increase their physical activity or have a higher level of physical activity, even if they combine active transport with motorized modes. So in addition to that, we did a number of studies looking at these different modes of transport to school. So for walking and cycling, I'll share a little bit of our findings. We look into comparisons, what do adolescents and their parents think about walking versus cycling. And more recent work has focused on how do those perceptions of walking and cycling actually differ based on how far they live from school. Uh, we had some work done on busing to school, looking at the barriers and facilitators for busing to school in Dunedin as well as the work about driving, in particular work driven, uh, uh, done by Debbie Hopkins, looking at adolescents' preference, ongoing preference and aspirations for motorized car-based travel. So here's just a little bit showing you the adolescents and parental perceptions of walking versus cycling to school. So compared to walking, cycling, for cycling adolescents had more personal barriers, that they perceive less social support from peers, from parents, from school. They have less positive attitudes. Fewer of them intended to, uh, to cycle to school. It was less preferred mode. They complained about more logistic or reported more logistic related barriers. And they perceive it to be overall less safe and have a less supportive infrastructure. So this is one of the first studies that actually compared both modes in a single research project. But this was interesting. So we looked into this last year and looked at how those perceptions actually differ based on how far adolescents live from school. So this is an example of parental perceptions and how they change based on uh, perceptions of walking to school and how they differ by distance. So here is those ones of limited and walkable distance. So up to 2.25 kilometers based on our data and some international data. That's a reasonable distance for adolescents to walk to school. Uh, cyclable distance would be up to four kilometers based on international data and then beyond four kilometers rarely we see any adolescents using active modes of transport to school. So if you look at some of those, for example, let's focus here on just environmental barrier. On average, we had 35% of parents saying there is actually not appropriate infrastructure, in this case footpaths, for adolescents to walk to school. But the problem was there is very few adolescents who, uh, who parents who said that if they live within a walking distance to school. That number of proportion increased if they live beyond walking distance, but within cycling to the distance to school. And most of those barriers were by those who live beyond cycling distance to school. So we actually observed that for both walking and cycling, uh, so those, those changes as the distance to school increased, what we saw is there was less social support and more personal environmental barriers for walking or cycling to school. So we, what we need to do is the future interventions really need to take into account how far those adolescents live from school and then we need to design interventions appropriately. So this is our latest findings, this is looking at the student data, similar thing, looking at how far they live from school and how those perceptions of walking and cycling change. And this is just a summary of our data. This is unpublished, so in preparation, don't cite it yet. <laughs> Hopefully we will have that out soon. But it actually shows how there are differences and uh, different uh, changes in the perceptions of both walking and cycling to school as the distance to school increases. One thing that is uh, interesting, so for example, for cycling to school, there was no difference in perception of the infrastructure. Lack of cycling lanes was observed at regardless of which distance that adolescents lived from school. And the same thing, overall intentions for cycling was very low, regardless of which distance they lived from school. So, I'm not going to go into details here, but this is just our analysis on the barriers to using public buses for transport in Dunedin. And this was led by Professor Jenny Mindell from University College London. And we identified using the BEAST data as well as some other previous research that I have led here in Dunedin. We identified barriers related to public buses themselves, but also social, the barriers related to social environment as well as built and natural environment. This is another, just an example of a slide. This is showing the work of Debbie Hopkins, looking at adolescents' aspirations for motorized transport to school based on a base, uh, based on a beach data. 
And what we found, there is actually a number of family factors, travel behaviors, attitudes and norms and intentions that are associated with adolescents' desire to uh, obtain a driver's license and basically aspirations for private car-based transport uh, to school. So we looked at that and um, it's, a, it's really showing trends are the same as we see in other Western countries. So I'm going to switch over now and just say there is a number of papers we've published related to correlates of active transport to school, so factors that relate to active transport to school. And I'm now going to pass to Lutfor, who is going to talk to you about his work related to built environment and school neighborhoods. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I will talk about uh, my research on school neighborhood building governments and Adolescents walking and cycling to school. Actually, uh, this uh, research is a part of this one, um, this R and this two study. Uh, we have already published two journal articles from our research project, and the first uh, one is related to model a conceptual framework uh, for safe walking and cycling route to school. Here is the framework, and we have considered three existing framework: ecological models, travel mood choice framework for school travel and 5 is framework. Now the question is, so why we consider this three existing framework? Actually, we try to identify a wide range of factors that are related to adolescents walking and cycling to school, as well as to identify the most influential factors that need to be considered for modeling safe route to school. In the ecological model, actually there are four key domains, uh, such as uh, individual factor, social factor, environmental factor, and policy factor. But we think that the safety issue, which is most important uh, and needed to consider for safe food to school is safety. And we think about that the safety issue is not directly addressed by the ecological model. Therefore, we uh, add safety component as an additional uh, component of ecological model, which consider traffic as well as personal safety. And in the ecological model, we can also classify the environmental factors into two categories, natural environment and built environment. And the next one is travel mood choice framework, which is very popular to investigate the travel behavior of children, uh, school going children. And there are three key components, such as urban form, mediating factors, and moderating factors. So what are the relationships between uh, travel mood choice framework and ecological model? If we look at that, the urban form is actually related to build environment, and the mediating factors is related to individual factors, social factors, and traffic safety and personal safety issues of ecological model. And the moderating factor is actually considered the individual and social factors. And the final one is five is framework, which is very popular in transportation infrastructure planning. Uh, and it is uh, recently used by some uh, city council uh, to design their road network for walking and cycling to school. There are five key components such as engineering, education, enforcement, in encouragement and evaluations. The engineering is the key component of this framework and it is also related to uh, travel mood choice framework, this urban form and the built environment of ecological models. And the rest of four component is actually related to the policy factors. Now we try to show what uh, are the most influential factors that need to be considered for modeling safe route to school. There are three key components, mediating factors, urban form, and moderating factors. So I uh, highlighted the most important factors among these all factors. The build environment is the key issues uh, that need to be uh, considered uh, to encourage adolescents to use more active transport to schools. And there are uh, so many issues, but uh, distance to school is the most uh, strong predictor that need to be considered because our study find that if distance increase, adolescents are less likely, less likely to use active transport to schools. And this evidence is supported uh, also in different urbanization settings. Another uh, issue is safety issues. So adolescents and their parents um, always concerned about safety. 
and uh, it, it could be in terms of traffic volume, traffic speed, uh, uh, it could be um, dangerous intersections. So uh, if there are laggings of uh, proper infrastructures or if there are uh, laggings of initiatives to control traffic volume and speed, uh, adolescents and their parents uh, are not feel safe enough to send their kids to school uh, by walking or cycling. Uh, mediating factors is normally uh, considered the passive personal safety and traffic safety factors. But the main issues that means that if in a neighborhood there are presence of crime, there are presence of um, uh, strangers in the school neighborhood area or along the walking and cycling route to schools, if there are lack of lighting facilities and not transparent facilities along the walking or cycling routes, they are not feel comfortable to walk or cycle to school. So we also need uh, to consider all these types of factors to morally safe food to school. We also investigate the active transport to school rates in different urbanization settings. Here we consider the safety issues uh, in terms of traffic volume, dangerous intersection, and we also consider the build environment. What build environment means? Build environment, we measure the four uh, criteria, four components. For example, intersection density, residential density, land use mix, and neighborhood walkability. There is a com common finding um, not, we found in the literature that if in a neighborhood is more walkable, then the rate of active transport to school is higher. But in our study, we find uh, the contradictory findings, for example, intersection density, residential density, and neighborhood, uh, neighborhood walkability is negatively associated with the active transport to school. That means adolescents are less likely to use active transport to school if there are higher residential density, intersection density, and neighborhood walkability. The different findings. Um, is uh, could be uh, there is a measurement approach, different measurement approach. Uh, we actually use the reasonable walking and cycling distance to school, which is not normally used in previous studies. So uh, this is the strongest thing we consider in our study because uh, there is a uh, contradictory findings that how far the adolescents would like to walk or cycle and. Uh, we find the threshold distance and we have included this analysis in our study. And another uh, thing said here, we find that the traffic safety and if there are presence of dangerous intersections in the school neighborhood area, so adolescents are less likely to use active transport to school. But the most important things here, we need to uh, conclude that the land use mix is, is still uh, positively associated to walking and cycling to school, although there are some weak relationships. And we also try to identify the build environment into different categories, try to measure this one. And this is called the objective measures and passive measures. The objective measure says that uh, we try to find out the build environment features measures by geographical information system, GIS, because we think that uh, it is uh, one of the uh, most important technique that actually represent the real uh, scenario of an school neighborhood. As well as we need to consider the uh, what adolescents and their parents think about their school neighborhood. And for this measurement, we actually use the news by questionnaire. And we find that the land use mix is negatively associated with uh, the um, uh, active transport to school rates in different urbanization settings, for example, small to medium urban area, as well as rural settings. So the main thing is that mm, the land use is not evenly distributed in a small to medium urban area, as well as rural settings. And that's why maybe um, uh, our, uh, our findings uh, is related to negative relationship with active transport to school. But the, one of the important things that uh, we find, uh, we would like to share with you all that the recreational facility is positively associated with active transport to school. 
Uh, that means if in a neighborhood or school located in a neighborhood with a wide range of recreational facilities within walking and cycling dis distance to school, uh, the active transport to school rate is higher compared to other facilities. And the last one, we also uh, try to um, make a comparison um, how adolescents walk and cycle to schools and is there any other influence in the school neighborhood built environment features. Uh, here we also use our base to students survey data. Um, last year we uh, completed uh, data collection from two schools and we find that uh, the presence of traffic volume along the walking and cycling route to schools and the dangerous intersection is the most important barrier to walk or cycle to schools. But the uh, interesting findings that if there are wide range of facilities in a school neighborhood, for example, playground, sports club, gymnasiums in the, um, in the school neighborhood area, then it is more positively associated with adolescents walking and cycling to school. This is the findings of mine, then maybe the next presenter will share with other findings. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, thank you much for, for sharing your research, Maggie. We're going to over, over to you. Maggie is going to briefly share with you what she is working on using the BITS data. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Now I'm going to share my, uh, my study, my PhD study with the BITS research program. I'm looking at slightly different perspective of what we can use from the BITS data. So uh, this is the title of my PhD study. I'm trying to find the association of the availability of food outlets, the true behaviors uh, among adolescents using different modes of transport to school. So as we know in the, in the beginning, uh, that the modes of transport to school is very, like they can use walking or cycling, they can use busing, or they can be driven or driving by themselves. And most of the time, it's not a matter of choice, but it's, the result of multiple and complex factors that has been also mentioned before from Sandy and for presentation. And uh, using the socio-ecological framework that has been mentioned before as well, uh, I'm trying to see whether there is any association of this modes of transport with uh, with other factors such as the, the food environment around the uh, around the school neighborhoods because the recent studies found that actually in the school neighborhood which is the built environment that uh, of which the adolescents passing through every single day uh, there are so many unhealthy food outlets such as daily shop and uh, fast food outlets and uh, my study is trying to find whether there is any association of this uh, different transport mode and the environment uh, and why is it important because uh, this exposure to the food environment around the school may lead them to the purchasing and the consumption of such food. And if they have been, if the food environment around the school is preoccupied by the unhealthy food environment, the purchasing and the consumption of such food will also follow the types of the unhealthy food. And um, it's, it can create, an, uh, it can lead to another health risk uh, factor, which is, uh, one of it is the overconsumption of such food, and this this type of overconsumption can also lead to obesity. And in the bigger picture, my PhD study is trying to see uh, whether the different modes of transport to school may be related to their consumption during the school journey, uh, and whether the environment around the uh, around the school neighborhood is partly or correlated with the the relationship itself. And I want I want to share with you as well one of the early finding from the visceral study that we have done uh, that have been collected uh, three years ago in the rural or in the Otago region. Uh, from 731 adolescents that being surveyed at the time, 55% uh, of them using motorized transport to school and 28% using walking or cycling and uh, the rest of it using combined uh, transport to school. And from this finding, we actually find that uh, 26% of the adolescents uh, consume, purchase or consume soft drinks during their school journey at least once from their weekly school trip. And more than a third of them consuming snack food on their journey to school. So uh, this is a session interesting because uh, it's a weekly consumption. 
and more than half, more than a third of them uh, consuming this food uh, weekly. And we are trying to see as well from uh, another, like, we are trying to see from neighbor definition and the weight status, uh, whether it's uh, having some correlated factors with them. And we find that there is a higher odds of snack food purchase among the those who are using mixed transport compared to those who are using motorized transport. And interestingly, there's actually a lower uh, lower odds of adolescents purchase and consuming soft drinks and snack food uh, from those who are having a healthy weight and those from, uh, sorry, it's wrong, it's the, uh, the least deprived, uh, the least deprived neighborhood compared to their, uh, compared to their counterparts. So, uh, this is the early part of my PhD study. It will be growing more in the in the future. But from this finding, we uh, uh, we can we can see that actually there is some association. We can see from the modes of transport to school and the uh, and the snacking consumption during the school journey. So hopefully, uh, the significance of my study will find about the adolescents' health behavior. Uh, will we'll provide more understanding of the health behavior of adolescents during their journey to school. Thank you. Excellent, Maggie. Okay. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to necessarily present these findings related to the school choice, although they're quite interesting, but just maybe to mention this slide, that when we look at the median, uh, about 10, uh, 11 or basically 12% of a private car trips and 12% of a car distance driven during the school commute time are related solely to the trips to school. And half of those trips are trip chain, meaning the parents are going to another place during as part of the journey. And basically we looked at the school choice in the name of adolescents can enroll in any school they want. If those ones that enrolled in a distance school actually went to the closest school, the citywide car traffic during the school commute time would be reduced by 7%. So that's something quite interesting, um, but we're not going to go into details. We did talk to the school principals about active transport to school, and it's really apparent that they are aware of what the barriers are and what the, what the potential, potential for uh, changes is, but they also realize that it's really, uh, from their perspective, it's not a highest priority for the school, and they don't really want to interfere with the family uh, travel-related decisions. So this work was led by Associate Professor Susan Sandretta of Montago. So before I hand over to our wonderful research assistant to share with you a little bit of behind the scenes work on the BEATS2 study that we're doing at the moment, I just want to show you briefly some of the uh, articles that we're working on at the moment uh, on a BEATS study. So we are looking at transport to school patterns across Otago, combining our data from the new as well as the wider Otago. We identified the profiles of the transport user groups and looked at their characteristics with respect to gender, car ownership, bicycle ownership, um, deprivation level. We also look at, I'll show you some distance differences by distance to school in transport, as well as geographical setting or settlement areas. And the work that I'm not gonna show you today is not published yet. Um, we're working on analyzing what are the factors that influence whether adolescents walk to school if they actually live in walking distance to school. And also, what are the influences on cycling to school if they actually live in cycling distance to school? A lot of research that's been done in this area was taking into account any sample adolescents without limiting the distance and just putting distance in what we call multivariate analysis. But the reality is we know that the distance is by far the strongest predictor of transport, active transport to school. If they live beyond walking or cycling distance to school, they're not going to walk or cycle regardless of the other factors. So those are some of the things we're working on at the moment. And uh, so I'll just share a couple of slides here. So this is a presentation looking at all of the adolescence data that we have, so 2,400 here. If we look at the distance to school, if they live within walking distance to school, there's actually 60 or 58% of them walking to school. So really, when we think about it, we don't really have a problem with active transport there. There is additional 6% that cycles to school, and then we have about 20% that are taking a car, even though they live that distance to school. So that's potentially one of the target groups that we could look at intervening at. 
If we now move beyond walking distance, but within cycling distance to school, we obviously, as expected, we see a significant drop in a proportion of adolescents that walk to school, but there's still about 14 of them within that distance to walk to school. Now we've got 6% of the students that cycle, but we've got 58% of them that are traveling to school by private people, either driving themselves or being driven to school. And then now buses are coming into the story. And then again, this is the whole point, if we see look, beyond four kilometers or beyond cycling distance, very few of them walk or cycle to school. And we've seen that in, the previous, in other research as well, heavy dependence on a motorized transport. So half of them are car-based and about a third of them are uh, bus. This white area represents all other modes or a mixed mode. The problem that we have is if we are reporting the averages for regardless without taking into account distance to school, we have a problem because in Otago, basically almost half of adolescents are living beyond, well, beyond cycling distance to school. So when we put everything in leverage, we design these wonderful interventions, we put the infrastructure, we encourage students and adolescents to walk to school. Well, if they are beyond walking or cycling distance to school, they're not going to walk or cycle to school regardless of the interventions. So we really need to think into account, to take into account distance and take some distance-based approaches to promoting active transport to school. So now, because in, the, in our study, we actually have data on different settlement types, this is now showing if they live in rural settlement, small urban area, medium urban area, or large urban area. Actually, the modes of transport to school were not that much of a difference across, especially if you look walking across those settings. And this is without taking into account distance, right? So we actually see a much bigger variation in these transport modes to school based on the distance to school than we see based on the settlement type. So here is those two slides that I just showed you. So this is distance to school and this is settlement type. So the papers that we are, journal articles that we're currently working on is actually, this is now showing you only those that live within walking distance to school, depending on a settlement type they live in, what are the rates of walking and cycling to school? So you can see within walking distance, basically between half and two thirds of adolescent cycle, oh, sorry, walk to school, regardless of the settlement type, like across settlement types. We see a larger variation in cycling to school in small urban areas, 17%. This is the Neiden, 1% of those that uh, walk to school. And then obviously there is a large difference in uh, motorized transport rates. So we're looking now in th among those adolescents, what are the factors that predict or correlate whether they walk or cycle to school? And comparison, now this is within cycling distance up to four kilometers, Again, you can see very similar rates of uh, walking to school across different settlement types, but significant differences in, uh, in um, cycling. So there is something happening in these small urban areas that includes Monaca and Cromwell, where we can look at how come they have much higher rates of cycling to school compared to other areas. So that's going to be a part of the future research. And as I mentioned, we did look into these profiles of users, but I'm not gonna go into details. And that actually helps us determine where are the future interventions and where should we go with the future interventions. So I'm gonna hand over now to Kim to tell you a little bit more about the BEATS data, BEATS2 study. We're not gonna present any more data, I promise. This is more about behind the scenes work. So Kim, over to you to share what you do on the BEATS team. Thank you. Oh, wow. Um, okay, so my presentation, I guess, is in complete contrast to the previous ones, um, and it really is from a person-to-person -person perspective, I guess, um, because my role, I think, is really just communication and logistics. That's my key job for the BEATS team, and it's been great to be involved for the last three years with the fantastic team that we've got. Um, so yeah, just, I guess, a little bit of insight, a little bit of background into what I do as the BEATS coordinator is really just to make sure that we have really, really good communication with the schools. Um, I know Sandy and I have met with um, many of the uh, principals of the schools or the uh, senior management at the schools to organize, hopefully getting them on board with the study. Um, and then really the key part for me going forward is once we have them engaged, and thankfully we have all 12 Dunedin secondary schools involved with the BEATS2 study, um, that I go on then and carry on um, maintaining great communications with the schools and the teachers that are involved in helping 
us to deliver the projects because um, we need to work with them in promoting the study to the students, uh, recruiting the students, and then making sure the students turn up for our data collection sessions when we go into the school. So um, a really key component, I guess, for me and what I've been learning as I go through is every school is very different. Every setup is very different. Every management style is very different. So I've had to adapt my communication styles to each school as well to make sure that we have them on board. Um, they feel like there's not too much for them to do. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, so from a logistical perspective, it's really, really important that the, the smooth running of those data collection sessions when we get there. So in complete contrast, I guess, to the results and what you're finding out from um, Sandy and from the PhD students, mine's really just, my role is really making sure that we get the data in the first place and that that data is clean and it's, um, it's the, the results that the researchers need. Um, and then obviously the other component for the communication sound, it's, I'm really there just to make sure everybody's happy and everybody is doing what they need to be doing and they feel supported. So I guess that's, um, it's all of you to see all of our cool photos here, all of our team, we have such a fantastic personalities and that really makes my job so much more fun. Um, so I really need to make sure that when Sandy and I go and meet with the principals, that all the information that we gather, I can communicate to the teams to say, right, this is what we're going to be doing. This is where we're going to be going. Please, can you make sure you can come along and help us? Um, and also maintain that with the schools as well, um, that they know when we're coming. Um, but logistically as well, just in the background, this is a great photo down here. There's many, many pictures of various stages where we're sticking things, getting all the beach study material ready. Um, there's a lot of work that goes in the background and um, it's so good to be able to work with such an effective team that we have everything organised and mostly that goes to Sandy because she's fantastic at project managing and she keeps us all in check. So I've definitely learned a lot along the way. Um, but we do a lot of work behind the scenes just to make sure when we are in the schools that and the students walk in the door, they're welcome with a smile and they come in and they um, take part um, and everything's organised for them. And I guess there's a, we have a lot of anecdotal, a lot of fantastic stories behind the scenes of all the work that goes into everyone setting up all the banners or the material and the equipment that we need to, to do the study and there's name tags going on over people's heads there's here you need a pen here's your, your, your clipboard and um, so that's really my thing is just to make sure that everybody else's job is made a little bit easier and that there's things they don't have to think about hopefully I've thought of and I can support them with it so um, yeah it's been good fun and I think that's yeah that's really it's, it's really valuable and really rewarding. And I think from my perspective as well, there's a lot of talking about the findings that we're getting, but from my perspective, working with the schools, talking to the students, um, it's really important that they understand as well what they will get back from the study as well, and what they can use going forward that will help them in their school community and their, their policies they have within the schools and things like that. So yeah, that's me. I think that's probably enough. And I know we're going to be passing on to my fantastic colleague. So. Great. Thank you, Kim. And now over to Paisa, who is another key bit research assistant, and she will share with you a little bit of work that she does for the team. Oh, hello everyone. Um, yes, I'm talking about more now what's happening during the data collection. And my main interest is how to get people more active. So Sandy, of course, gave me this task um, to measure the physical activity levels of students. And this is the tool for measuring the physical activity levels. And and show you how we were, or the students were. So they put it on their hip, on the right side. And the idea is the student is keeping this for seven days and every day using this for 12 hours per day and taking this off when they are sleeping or doing sleeping or taking a shower. But otherwise, what we get for those uh, tools, activity meters, we get the levels of the physical activity. So it's not about, um, we are not following them, it's not GPS tracking advice, so we just get these graphs. And later on, also the students are getting the same graphs, so it's really interesting also for students to see how active they actually are. And what happens during the data collection, of course, we ask students first, do they want to take part of this um, tool or measurement uh, to the meter measurement. And 
if they want. So that's all happens during the data collection day. So we set them up and give them activity meters after school day. So that's what happens during data collection. And then I think the best part of this work for me is the teamwork. So all the study, um, the work, we are doing it as a team. And as you can see all these pictures, everyone is smiling, we are happy. Uh, we come from different backgrounds, different countries, but this team really works well together. And I think this is the funniest and uh, the best part of the work for me. Okay, great. Thank you, Kaisa. We'll finish off now with um, just uh, and open up the floor for questions. But basically, we release every two years a program report. So you're welcome to you pass this to the people, the audience. Um, we release the program report. This is the latest one that we just released. This is for our stakeholders, policymakers, anybody who is interested in our work. And it provides a summary of what we've been doing in a lay language and reference to the full, uh, full information if anybody would like to look up the research articles. So with that, I'd like to thank the entire team, everybody who is here, many people around the country and around the globe who participated in this work and many people who have contributed to the BEATS team over the last eight years. And um, I would like to thank this, my wonderful co-presenters. If you can all come here, please now. Uh, that would be great. And uh, I'll be very happy to open the floor for questions and answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Yes. So um, on your little diagram of the research dissemination, I noticed that it doesn't say Ministry of Education, have you had any engagement? Uh, we had a uh, Ministry of Education, we did disseminated findings related to uh, school choice only and implications of a school choice because the, and that's part of that kind of skip quickly. Looking at a school choice, we actually found it has not only implications on the transport of school, but also on health environment and uh, basically education. So we did disseminate those findings to them, but it was very brief, um, brief delivery of the findings in that area. We're still working on a further analysis uh, from a parental perspective on a school choice, and that is one of the areas where we need to engage a little bit further. But really from our work with the principals, it's really showing how complex the school environment is. And we know that as a researcher is coming there. And um, it's really trying, it's that, it's that competing tensions between the policies and policy making between the schools, what they can do and would like to do, and how much time and the resources they have to put in certain areas. Um, I was thinking, I think, in, in your presentation, listing the built environment and those factors didn't make it to the school gate. Some of those, so the pick up and drop off areas would be an influence. Um, and if it's really easy to drop your kids off in the car, then you're more likely to do it. If it's if there's not enough cycle storage. So I, I know from experience that we're looking at building new schools now, the demand isn't there for the cycle storage, so they don't have these facilities. So it's kind of chicken or the egg, they don't cycle because there's no end of five facilities. So obviously the, the cohort of schools you had are all existing schools and there was a sort of a, a massive drop in cycling um, from the 90s through to now. So did they have a, still have a lot of um, cycle storage that was underutilised or had that been rationalised? That's, that's a very good point. Actually, as we did the interviews with the school principals, we found out that because of concerns of safety of cycling, Quite a few schools completely removed bike racks from their from their school grounds. So even if you cycle, you don't have anywhere to park, park your bike. That was one issue. And you're right with uh, the part of the work that uh, Lutfur is doing with the uh, school neighborhoods. We're really trying to and showing some of these accelerometer well, activity meters data that even if you use mixed modes, you're still getting quite a bit of physical activity almost during almost as much as somebody who's using active transport. And we know that there will always be people living beyond walking and cycling distance to school. So one of the key things that Lutfur is doing is actually looking into making suggestions that maybe we need to put those drop-off and pick-up areas further away from school, 
along the safe routes. So we're reducing the traffic jam at the school pickup and drop off time. And we're allowing adolescents to get not only exercise, but also socialize, see their friends. So that's one of the key kind of things that things are, that are coming out and recommendations are coming out from this research. So those are excellent questions. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, if not, thank you all very much for your for coming today and for listening to our talk. And if you have any questions for us, feel free to contact us. And we hope to be able to share with you more of our findings of the bits to study that will be coming up in the upcoming years. Thank you all.